She's about to turn 20. That's a, that's a big one right there. Yeah. Oh, we're live. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We're very pleased to have with us John Archibald. John is a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the Birmingham News and Alabama Media Group. And he has for decades been a, a really a keen observer and a, and a strong voice um, looking at Alabama politics, Alabama culture, and, and a strong voice for, for good government and, and, um, and equal rights in Alabama. And that, that's a, a subject that, that can keep you busy for a long time. Um, we're very glad to have John tonight to talk about his new book, um, Shaking the Gates of Hell, a search for family and truth in the wake of the civil rights revolution. Um, I'm gonna hold it up even though it's gonna be backwards. I don't know how to fix that, but that's what it looks like. And um, it's an awfully fine book and it's been getting uh, great reaction. Uh, John, I haven't seen a stinky review yet. Um, so that's far, gotta so be good. Yeah, that has to be satisfying. I saw a great one in the Washington Post the other day. Um, so we are going to uh, chat for a while. Um, if anyone has questions or comments, please put them in the chat room. We'll hope to have uh, some questions from our, um, our audience. And um, so I'm gonna start, well, let, would you like to take just a couple of minutes and just sort of tell us the, 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 the idea of the book and, and what it is you were doing, trying to do? Sure. Um... Yeah, so, I mean, it's weird to have to start at the beginning of me, I guess, but I was born in outside Birmingham and the son of a preacher in uh, April 1963, which was, as people in Birmingham will recognize that moment in time when Dr. King was in jail writing his letter um, that, among other things, excoriated the white church for its silence on issues of civil rights. Um, and, you know, I always figured that my dad was a uh, on the right side of all that from his uh, pulpit uh, at Alabaster Methodist Church at the time, um, because that's, he always, he was always a proponent of uh, desegregation and civil rights and rights of everyone. Um, but when I, after he died, I, I found uh, a couple of file cabinets of his uh, down in my basement for storage actually, that had every sermon he'd ever given in them. And, uh, when I looked at that particular, you know, I started by looking in April of 1963 and, you know, at the Children's Crusade and, and, and what I found was largely silence um, and it didn't match the man I knew. So I uh, attempted to find out what he said, what he didn't say and why. And that formed the basis of the book, the why really. Mm -hmm. Um. In the book, you relate this um, experience of exploring your father's um, outspokenness or lack thereof to to Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham Jail and um, his uh, his pleading to to white clergy and his disappointment in white clergy. Could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, um, I mean he's he's there in there in jail, of course, and you know eight eight Birmingham clergy members. Uh, Christians and Jews had, had basically told him to hold off awake, you know, what do you, you know, we, we, we've got this under control. It's not the right time. And that was what spawned the letter, of course. And, and in his letter, as you talk about it, it, uh, among those things, um, in addition to, you know, he, he talked about his disappointment in the church and there's, you know, the one line in there, you know, there, there has to be great love if there's great disappointment is, is one that I'd always sort of looked over in the past, you know, it's, not, it's because it didn't really resonate that much with me for some reason. But, um, but when I started looking at, at my dad, the person I love and respect more than anybody in the world, frankly, um, I really came to understand that phrase. King was talking about the church and I was talking about my dad in, within the church, uh, thinking, and it ultimately became sort of a theme of the book, uh, great love and great disappointment. And uh, I hope that, you know, we've often talked a lot about the great disappointment, um, but it, it doesn't mean anything without the love, which is why, you know, which is why um, 
I wanted desperately to show, I mean, I wanted desperately to hold my dad as accountable as he should be held for silence in that really crucial time in this really crucial place. Um, but I also really wanted to show the whole 360 degrees of him that I knew um, in hopes that, you know, people could, you know, maybe see themselves or somebody they cared about in it. Yeah, um, you know, when you grew up in the South, when you and I did, um, <laughs> you got a lot of mixed messages from, from adults in your life. Um, you know, you, you would grow up around people who, in many ways, were very decent people, um, but not always when it came to the issue of race. Um, you, you describe, you know, one of the things I like about this book is, is, is an examination of race in the South, and then that's the thread that runs through everything always. But it's also a really fine just family story and how that those two um, experiences, um, you know, shape you. And um, I wonder if you could talk more about your father, um, not only what he did or did not do in terms of race, but just as a man, as a father, as, a, as an example to you that you know, that you think shaped you and made you what, what you are now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, he, he and my mom both, but he um, he was, and to this day is the most principled person I've ever met. I mean, he was, and he, he was the kind of guy who would show up uh, always when you needed him. In the book, I talk about how um, when somebody uh, wrote my sister's phone number on the wall at school. I mean, he didn't call the principal. He marched in there with a can of, of Lysol or whatever and a rag and knocked on the door and walked in there and cleaned it off. And, you know, when I, uh, when I managed to get in trouble and get tossed in jail at 18 um, for stealing a box of condoms from Big B Drugs, uh, he, uh, I didn't tell my dad because uh, I had hoped with everything in my soul that he would uh, uh, not find out about it. Um, but instead, uh, he, he, he came, found out and came into the courtroom uh, to be with me, not to get me out of it, but uh, to be there uh, with me. And I, I still remember he patted me on the knee and said, you know, uh, you know, it's wrong to steal. And I said, yeah, I know it's wrong to steal. Actually, I didn't say anything. I just nodded my head. And he said, uh, and I'll be eternally grateful for this, that we're not even going to talk about what you took. So <laughs> I got the message loud and clear. But I mean, he loved nature. He loved people. I'm sorry, go ahead. At least you were trying to be responsible. I was. I was. That's my defense. And I'm sticking to it. I'm sticking to it as I threw myself on the mercy of the court and got none. <laughs> So um, I know you've been you've been talking a lot about the book, and um, I'm sure you're hearing from people. Are, are people sharing their stories with you? Uh, they are. They are, and it's remarkable. It's really got me thinking. I, I, I've talked to uh, um, you know preachers who ex who tried to make you know who tried to speak uh, and suffered consequences, and the children of preachers who tried to speak. And not just preachers, rabbis, uh, uh, you know, non—I mean, secular people, people who have stood up and uh, or who tried to 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 break the silence, which was pretty gripping, and with various different stories. I mean, uh, they tell me both about the sense of pride they have in having done that, even if they suffered, and some talk about the, the toll it took on. On their parent or their mother, perhaps when their when their father decided to to take stands, they talk about uh, both both sides of it, the the consequences, and the just feeling of having done something that you should have done. Um, and I've also talked to people who who like my dad, uh, like the people Dr. King was talking to, the people of goodwill, who uh, didn't couldn't find the voice to say what needed to be said at that time. Uh, there's a lot of remorse and a lot of sadness and a feeling that they failed in some way. And, uh, and so, uh, I mean, I, I, I've taken that, I mean, I, I've been really pleased with the response. I mean, because I was expecting a lot more, frankly, misunderstanding of what I was trying to say than, than I've so far gotten. And I've, 
I mean, the, the, the one thing I really wanted was for people to, to under, people who read it to understand what I was trying to say. And so far, it, it seems to surpass my goals. Well, that's great because you do walk a fine line when you, when you do something like this. And, you know, uh, there's that fine line between trying to understand your family and, and holding them up for ridicule or uh, which you do not do, but I think some writers do. And um, so, yeah, that uh, it's a brave thing you did. It really is. And I know it wasn't an easy thing. I, I don't know if I could write about my family because your family was way closer to the, the right side of things than mine was. Well, you um, know, I'm not saying that some people haven't said, you know, I think you were too hard on your dad. Yeah. I mean, there, there is some of that, no doubt. I mean, uh, and I, I get that uh, again, but you know, that's that thing that, that's the thing that kept me awake nights during the whole process is trying to trying to to be honest and um compassionate at the same time i suppose mm -hmm. and uh I, I can't i won't ever know if i got the words right but <laughs> but they were my words whether you know i said what i wanted to say so i got to stick to them yeah you know I you you talk in the book and it's very clear along with um your disappointment with some aspects of, of how your family responded to these issues your father in particular there's also a disappointment with the church with the methodist church that that's you know when you grow up in a church that's that's an extended family that um and you know it, the methodist church did not always comport themselves as well as we would have hoped um like other churches but you also talk about uh your namesake john rutland who is is kind of a singular figure in a lot of ways um could, could you talk more about reverend rutland yeah and and yeah as my mom my mom always told me that uh and we've had we had a conversation in the past about this that was really interesting to me but um my dad, my mom always told me I was named for John Rutland. My my dad always told me that I was named for John the Baptist. So you know, it's, <laughs> pick one, I guess. But John Rutland was a, a Methodist preacher um, at the uh, at Woodlawn Methodist Church when uh, one of his uh, uh, members of his congregation was none other than Bull Connor himself. And um, and in John Rutland's book, he talks about how. Um, how he would preach uh, of, of, of desegregation and Bull Connor would stand up and say he wasn't going to take no more of this inward preaching and stomp out. And there are stories about uh, him, uh, 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 about multiple confrontations between him and Bull Connor, which, you know, I always, th I always thought of, as kind of odd considering that this was a person that my uh, my mother says I was named after, but I didn't ever hear those stories until I read that book. And and uh, as, as we talked about in the past, um, whether that book is accurate or not, I don't know, but those were the words of John Rutland. And, yeah. Uh, and they have been echoed by a number of people I've met. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, there's always that question, um, but I, I remember, uh, one time talking to someone who was a member of that church and he was telling me that none of that stuff didn't happen. He said, because first bull would have had to have come to church. <laughs> uh, so. He was, what's that Scott, uh, Scott Douglas line is that, uh, uh, I can't remember. I can't remember the line now, but it's what you always got to remember is that bull Connor was a Sunday school superintendent, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, he was actually um, not at Woodlawn Methodist, but at a previous church. Yeah, he and um, and was very active in the church when he was younger. But according to and also according to his widow, he he she felt like things might have turned out better if Boyd we'll spent a little more time in church. <laughs> so there is um there's a, there's a historian I like a lot named uh, Fred Hobson. He he taught at UNC and. Um, in one of his books, he talks about what he calls the Southern rage to explain, the rage to explain. And I kept thinking about this as I was reading your book. And um, 
he talks about how you know white Southerners in particular, those who come to, especially those who come to question the teachings of their upbringing, often feel a need to explore that and try and explain that. Um, and I had to write this down. He said, you know, that these Southerners look at their region in love and in anger, in pride and in shame. Um, moving beyond your family and the church, as a Southerner, as a white male Southerner, um, you know, what did it mean to, to explore these issues in, in that broader sense? And, and what, do you, what do you feel like you learned or, or achieved in, in exploring that? Interesting question. And, and, you know, I don't feel like I honestly don't feel like I was trying to explain the South. Um, maybe some of the m moments in history and it maybe 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 there's more explanation than I'm giving myself credit for right now, because there is a good bit that goes back to to the Jim Crow, I mean, to Reconstruction and the Constitution and Jim Crow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the last thing, I, I certainly don't want to make excuses for it because uh, I think what I more intended to do was to look back at people that uh, were loved and revered and held up as um, as the, the good people who uh, were uh, uh, with open arms and, and, and uh, you know, loving the all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, and all that. Um, and to find out that they, these people who had flocks, I mean, my dad was a preacher, his dad was a preacher, his dad was a preacher, his dad was a preacher. They had flocks that they were supposed to lead to um, the, uh, the right pastures, right? And, um, you know, to find out when the people you respect the most uh, are um, for what, for whatever reason, whether it's this conspiracy of silence that uh, Professor Bill Nicholas, uh, formerly of UAB of, uh, of Birmingham Southern, talks about, um, or peer pressure, or fear of losing people in the congregation, whether this conspiracy of silence is so oppressive that it causes even the best of people to look the other way. Um, I th maybe that is an explanation, um, but I don't think it, but it's certainly not an excuse. And, um, and I think that if we see them then, and I say this with everybody I talk to, because I've got to, but, you know, I don't for a m minute think that we can go back and put ourselves in the time and place of anybody else. Um, but we can sure look at the people, especially those we admire the most and say, you know, if they, if they disappointed us then, or if they, stepped on the wrong side of history, even unknowingly, um, then we can use that now to figure out how we're going to act and behave every day and tomorrow. And, and I hope that that's the value of it. It's not, it's, that it's not so much an exploration of the South in my eyes, but an exploration of people. And it's not a book about my dad. It's a book told through my dad. It's about us. Mm -hmm. And that's my goal anyway. Well, and these issues haven't gone away. Mm -mm. We, we keep getting we keep getting reminded of that. Um, we seem to be, you know, I, 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 again, you know, uh, growing up in, in, I don't know about you, but growing up as a white guy in uh, the Burm in Alabama, uh, all of the issues that took place, you know, I was born in 1963, and all the issues that took place around in Birmingham at that time, I was completely oblivious to, until I was fully grown, long past the no Alabama textbooks and the thing they taught mm -hmm. me in school, which didn't include any of that. Um, and, and it was really going to work in Birmingham that allowed me to understand. And I think that so many people in Alabama are, our, I mean, not just our, our age, but uh, even significantly younger, I think, don't have a proper education on the significance of what took place here and why. And, um, and that's, that's a really distressing thing when you think that people all over the world know our history a lot better than we do ourselves. It, it is. I, I still, you know, I, I, I talk to students, high school and even college, and you know, they, from here, they don't know who Fred Shuttlesworth was, you know, mm -hmm. and um, you know, they don't know who Bull Connor was. And, and you know, we, we need, I mean, we're still working this through, you know, and, you know, 
few years ago, I thought, um, I thought we'd come so far. We had a black president and everything, you know, and uh, my daughter went to fine arts high school. So all her friends were, you know, artsy kids and um, very open. And, uh, and I thought, man, the world's getting really doing well. And then, uh, you know, then we had an election and everything changed. And, um, and you know, I think it's good to be reminded. I'm a, I'm a straight white guy in the United States of America. Of course, I think things are OK, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you're not, if you're not looking outside yourself, um, enough. um, yeah, but don't you feel like, I mean, uh, that, you know, most of our lives having, having, having been born, I'm not sure the difference in our ages, but, um, we're close, you're older but, than you, uh, but, you know, growing up it really in that turbulent time, by the time we became school kids, you know, integration had begun and people started for a little while looking forward and, 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 you know, trying to make that change mean something. And I think that was the golden age of integration in Alabama because we resegregated ourselves pretty quickly after that, after, I, after I got out of school particularly. But, um, but I think that, I think that we've lost a lot with, with that, uh, sort of regression. And, you know, we can of course, nationally, uh, and locally, uh, people have uh, people who used to be ashamed to express their racism, but that has no that is no longer the case. And it strikes me that we're seeing more and more images and sound bites that sound a lot like 1960, 63, than sounded like 73 or 83 or 93 or 2003. And I'd never heard. I mean, I, I can for the first time in my life put myself back in a position of people who were living in through 1963 and imagining uh, what they must have been feeling and experiencing and the pressures they felt, um, which is scary. Well, and, and, you know, looking at what's happening now with voter suppression, um, we're also reliving the 1890s and 1901 in Alabama. Um, you know, when, when our state had its Constitution Convention in 1901, they were very open about the fact that we're here to disenfranchise the Negro. Mm-hmm. Um, they weren't using coded language or anything, and um, and we're back there again, mm-hmm. you know, where where people talk. I guess I guess we can at least be thankful they're being honest <laughs> about what they're trying to do. But uh, I'm afraid they might succeed, and that, that's right. um, you know. I mean, just um, just no, like the, just like I mean, yeah. Sorry to you know, but you know, again, it, it again, it is it is what. You know, it's exactly the thing Dr. King was talking about with uh, with uh, 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 the people of goodwill who uh, who don't do the job. I mean, if if any of those things you mentioned, um, with all of those, they could have only succeeded uh, with the silence of people of goodwill who knew mm-hmm. better, who knew yep. it was wrong. Jim Crow, the whole thing. And so every time there's a step forward there, I mean, historically and now, there is a, a recalibration and voter right suppression comes up and, um, and so many things that just, it, 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 it makes this long line of, of, of wrongs um, it's just so much more current. And when we look at it, as, at it as history, I don't know, it's somehow comforting that it's history, but when it's not, history it's on us and you know that's and that's the thing and that's where the silence comes in and that's where looking the other way comes in and pretending that it's not happening and it's the exact same thing that happened in pulpits and in boardrooms and in um, police stations and everywhere else in those times we're talking about um, so um as an archivist, I, I'm very drawn to this image of, of that filing cabinet in your basement, mm-hmm. you know, with, with uh, your dad's sermons and all that potential in there. Um, and, and you didn't find what you hoped to find. Um, but what did you find? Because you admit in the book, and, and I would have been the same way, you weren't really paying attention in church when you were. Right. Here. Um, so what did you find that you didn't expect or that you didn't know about your father or that um, expanded what you not understand about it. What I found, I mean, it's really amazing because it's 50 years of sermons. And, in the, you know, in the Methodist church, um, 
the preachers moved periodically, especially back in those days. It was every three to five years, every two to five years, really, um, as a matter of course. So there were a lot of sermons, but a lot of them were used over and over again in different churches sometimes. But so they would be, they would be dated in individual year by year filing cabinets. I mean, files with every time it was used again, it was dated and new notes were put on it, that thing. So you could start, you could start at 1950 essentially and, and read every sermon he ever gave and see the updates and, um, and they'd be notated with whoever he, you know, was citing in there, whoever uh, he was crediting. Um, and I mean, it was just remarkable. And they were typed and uh, and and all that. Um, but what was really interesting for me was sort of uh, watching the the maturation, I guess, of him. And I thought back to to myself as a younger person who was unable to, you know, find his voice on things. And um, which is, of course, a natural thing for an ambitious young person to, to be trying to find the right thing to say, but not necessarily have it. And of course, it made me think about the, th the times that I didn't say anything um, about things or the times I'm a columnist who writes three times a week and you, I sh I'm sure, can attest that I haven't always said the right things, right? <laughs> so, so I mean, there's there's that. Some so I would say you never did. <laughs> what? Some would say you never did. Some would certainly say that. Yeah. And some are saying that now. But yeah. Um, yeah. But so I mean, all that's going through my head as I examine what he's writing, and and um, and you know, there was he relied on an awful lot of parable uh, and sort of with hope that I think people would would. Uh, you know, take that message internally and lead them in the right direction. Um, and so I'm like beating my head against the wall saying, I want you to say it in a different way. I want you to be specific about it, which may or may not be fair. Uh, I, I, I personally believe there are moments in time you have to, there are moments to, to, to be subtle and there are moments to be firm. And, uh, and I realized completely as well that I'm in a completely different business than uh, than being a preacher. But uh, the only similarity being is that we both have sorts of pulpits. But uh, but th all those things were going through my mind. And every time I read one and would find uh, the silence, the silence was loud, particularly when you look at the corresponding dates, whether that's the Children's Crusade, when he's talking about, uh, you know, on Children's Sunday as it happened, in Alabaster to, to talk about issues of the world that were completely unrelated to those right outside, well, 23 miles from outside the stained glass window. So um, I can't remember where I was going with that. I'm sorry, but I mean, it was just, 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 uh, it was really emotional to see that and, and, and to see when there would be breakthroughs. Um, the, uh, the breakthroughs that began to come, which really kind of mirrored the acceptance within the church itself, because I think above all, my dad was a company man to the church. And, and I think that more than fear or fear of retaliation or any of those things, he was um, preaching as his bosses in the church would have him preach. Um, which is to avoid the issue of race at that time and uh, to concentrate on the gospel. I, I mentioned, sorry to just go on and on, but I mentioned Bill Nicholas, the professor from Birmingham Southern who, who's written a book on this conspiracy of silence in the church. And he, uh, and he, he, uh, he, he laughs at the Methodists who, um, who say they like to keep politics out of the pulpit um, but by making a decision not to talk of politics in the pulpit, you're making a political decision. So uh, I think that I think that that's an interesting perspective. Um, I'm going to ask Candace. We have Candace Hardy, one of my colleagues, who's managing the technology for us tonight. And I I saw a question in the chat box, but I, I couldn't see it all. Uh, Candace, can we put that back? John, can you see that when it comes back? Yeah. Please so. 
Yeah, uh, John, uh, let's see, I love the part of the book near the end where your dad tells you he's proud of you for speaking out on race in your columns as a newspaper columnist. How does that make you feel? Uh, that makes me feel a lot <laughs> because uh, number one, it was, it was a moment, it was the last time I ever saw my father alive for one, and he was in hospice and he was barely able to talk. Um, and I had uh, come up to see him. He was in Decatur, uh, Alabama, and uh, and he just reached out and grabbed my hand and, you know, told me, he said, I'm proud of you for taking on the race question, as he put it, which is what all the preachers of that generation called issues of race was the race question, which kind of bugs me because I think that that uh, sterilizes it a bit. Um, but, you know, I didn't really think of it that much at the time because I'd just written something and I didn't know at the time that he had struggled so much to find his own voice on those issues. So when, um, when I was writing this book, I of course turned to that and saw it in a different way than I'd ever seen it before. And I kind of saw it one as as sort of a deathbed regret, you know, that he he felt like he needed to say that in that moment in time, and and he died uh, within a couple of days or so. Um, and and I also, and this may be a self-serving excuse, uh, s sort of took it as a uh, permission um, to take. Uh, this look that I was looking, and um, and I don't know if that's self-serving and uh, or not. But my, my my I was talking to my oldest brother today, who 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 feels the same way. So um, that's certainly comforting. What do you think if if your dad had regrets that um, seeing your career develop and, and seeing how outspoken you are on these issues, do you think that was that was a comfort to him? Or, or gave yeah, him some... I, do, I do think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I think he, I do think he always appreciated uh, it. I think that he felt in some ways trapped by his career to, mm -hmm. to be very careful about what was said, which is part of the problem. Um, but it's also, I, I understand that the, the dynamics are different when you're trying to hold the church together than when you're paid through to write a column three times a week to, mm -hmm. um, to especially in the manner in which I write it, which is uh, often fairly uh, blunt or um, uh, highly charged in some way, um, perhaps less than used to be, but who knows. Um, but, um, I, I, I think, I think that he appreciated it and nodded along mm -hmm. if he didn't uh, want to say it out loud. Um, you also, you, you talk about your sibling, you mentioned your brother. Does Roy have another question? Uh, yeah, Roy asks, uh, you see the similarities between the white silence during the 60s civil rights movement and white silence on the racial injustice movement inspired by George Floyd's killing, which is an interesting question because if you had asked me this last spring, I would have given you a different answer or early summer anyway, um, because you know, still one of the most amazing sights I've ever seen, and maybe it says a lot about what I consider amazing uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, but. Uh, Still, the image of you know what thousand white people kneeling on the a thousand Mountain Brook white people kneeling on the ground outside Mountain Brook Elementary School, I think it was, um, was quite a sight, you know. And I don't know that it means anything today, but it meant something that day. Um, and I don't know if it lasts. And it certainly appears it's become a one of those political um, footballs that we have. And I don't know if any of that progress. <laughs> is lasting, but for sure, um, there was more understanding um, and empathy among white people after that event than there had been for just about any similar events that I can recall. And, um, 
and the number of people who have accepted not just in slogan, but in belief uh, that Black Lives Matter is, uh, is, a, is a huge win. Um, so there are a lot of people who are not silent. There are a lot of people on the other hand who are actively in opposition, which is, which is a dangerous, horrible thing. Um, and you know, how many people remain silent? I'm sure there are quite a few. And uh, it'd be good to have their voice heard. Yeah, it, it seems like, you know, the, the killing of George Floyd is just, I mean, it, it's, a, it's like watching a lynching. Uh, you know, this man strangled to death. It's just it's horrible. And, you know, it, it, it seems like occasionally in, in our uh, fumbling along on race, the people who are who we would say are on the wrong side of this um, just go too damn far, and you know, I think 16th Street church bombing is an example of that. Um, you know, you, you even even to, to many racist whites, you don't kill children and you don't kill little girls, and it, it seems like each time one of these incidents happens, we, a few more whites peel away to to maybe consider, you know, like you said in Mountain Brook, they're, they're kneeling for Black Lives Matter to, to at least um, look with new eyes at these issues. But then, as you said earlier, then we take these steps backwards. We, we bounce back and forth on this. And I, I like to think each time we bounce forward, we, we gain a little bit, maybe. Um, but again, that's easier for me to say than, uh, th than many people in this country. Um, yeah, I mean, the, does the arc of the universe bend toward justice? Is does the, it? Yeah, yeah. It, um, we all thought it did, but yeah, you know, we're not, I, I'm not so sure. I know it, it. It it gives you hope, and then it breaks your heart over and over again. I think um, you also uh, <laughs> one of my favorite parts of the book too was. Uh, where well, you talk about your siblings, and um, these are interesting people you grew up with, and uh, and um, <laughs> I wonder if you talk a bit just about um, you know your your brothers and sisters. Yeah, um, yeah, I've got I've got two brothers and a sister, uh, Murray, Marybeth, and Mark, and uh, they're all older than me. So uh, what that resulted in for me was a lot of trips to the hospital because we. we we uh we did a lot of dangerous things, and some of the pictures we have are, are frightening to look at now. But um, but you know they always took care of me, and they well for the most part, and uh, um, and really taught uh, me everything. You know, I, I, I sort of believe honestly, um, and you know a big part of that, and a big part of the book, you know, is when my oldest brother Murray came out. Uh, was gay in uh, like 1973, 1974, and my dad was um, pastor at First, Meth First United Methodist Church of Decatur, and which of course 1973 or 74 was a very different time than it is today. So that had uh, uh, a, a, a great deal of uh, uh, a great deal more impact than people would you know think about it today uh, on on him. And so the, a lot of that story is um, is is how my dad in the church dealt with that issue. Uh, but for me, for me, it was, uh, it was just so critically important because, you know, all those times that I was a kid, you know, getting my head bashed open on a trampoline or putting my hand through a window at a parsonage and, you know, cutting my arm up or, um, or falling down and busting my head on the ice or, you know, time after time, I'm going to the hospital and time after time, my older brother, Murray, uh, is the one who's carrying me to the hospital and making, you know, making sure uh, as, you know, as my dad fainted in the, <laughs> in the emergency room, uh, bless his heart. Um, you know, he was, he, the guy I know is not, he's just the, my big brother who took care of me every time I needed somebody to take care of me. And when people make this big thing about, uh, you know, you know, he, he you know, he, 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 about his sexuality, uh, you know, and, and this is a guy who's a 
staunch member of his church who was with his partner until he became his husband for 35 years until, uh, you know, who is a devoted, loving person. I, I really want people to know him as a person before they judge him as something they don't understand. And so uh, that uh, has took on a very important part of the book to me. And uh, the way that my dad, while he still, while in that issue, he, he had trouble at first finding ways to talk about that as well. Um, he never for a second loved his son any less. And, um, and as my brother, you know, said at his funeral to a bunch of Methodist preachers uh, who were in the, uh, in the congregation then, um, you know, if he had not showed that love to him then, then, then Murray would not have um, found a, a home in his church as he does now. And so um, there's an investment in people and, um, and in seeing people as people. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want this to end like a job interview, but is there anything I, I, I should have asked? Anything you? you well, you're the, you're the first person yet that didn't ask me about the water moccasin massacre of 1998. <laughs> but, well, let's go there then. <laughs> uh, it, well, it's, it's, it's a chapter that I probably, I thought probably didn't belong in this book, but, but my editor liked it. And it turns out that everybody that I've talked to, that many, well, not everybody, but that many of the people who write me about the book like uh, both the least and the most. They like the story the least because it gives them bad dreams, but they like my wife's response to it best of all, which uh, is somewhat profane, but uh, some think hilarious. So, um, but it's, a, it's about the mass extermination of lots of baby uh, water moccasins. Uh, and it is in gruesome in its detail. Yet, one of my favorite memories in life. Well, if you grew up in the South, you killed some snakes. That's, yep. that's part of it. Yeah. That's right. And, and yeah, you just when you try to skin them, you don't expect a bunch of baby snakes to start tumbling out. No, that's not pretty. That's just not <laughs> no, pretty. it's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, thank you very much. Uh, for your time well, and, thank you. and for your book. I, it, I, I can't recommend it enough. It's one of the best things I've read in a long time. Well, and uh, let's see, Candace is sending me a message. Oh, where can we purchase the book and how can people connect with the author? Oh. Um, you can purchase the book at any place books are sold, I hope. Certainly from uh, all, all our great local retailers from uh, uh, Little Professor to Alabama Booksmith to Books a Million has been great. Thank you, books, all those places. But you can order it from Amazon or any of your favorite uh, others if you like. And uh, and I would appreciate it if you do. Uh, the audio book, I, I, I did not do the audio on it, but I love the guy who did, Cameron Scoggins. He did a great job and uh, he did it better than I would. So I appreciate that. Uh, you can connect on Twitter at John Archibald. Uh, you can always email me, jarchibald at al.com. And uh, I would love to hear from you, uh, no matter what you think. Well, thank you again. Um, I, I know you have a little time left on your, uh, is it a fellowship mm -hmm. at Harvard? And it mm -hmm. sounds that I'm, I'm very jealous. I'm very jealous. Um, but um, I hope I've never felt dumber in my life. Well, you know, that's... It's and I hard. felt pretty dumb. Yeah, well, that's what Harvard exists for. Um, so anyway, great. Thanks. It's always good to see you. Always good to talk to you. And um, carry on. Like, thank you, Jim. Much appreciated. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye.